Hello and thank you for joining Process Minor University's first recorded podcast of 2021. I'm Tom Tullock and I will play host for today's podcast where I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing author and head of data science at Process Minor, Dr. Chit Ranjan. Having recently published a book entitled Understanding Deep Learning, I thought I'd take the opportunity to get to learn a little more about what motivated Chit to write the book and by listening in, you will hear his perspectives on the evolution of artificial intelligence and the role deep learning plays in this rapidly evolving field of technology. So buckle up and put your ear pods in tight for this entertaining and enlightening interview. Chip, thanks for agreeing to be our guest for this podcast. We're fortunate to have this opportunity to speak with you, and I have a lot of questions. Just in time, let's jump right in, shall we? Sure, sure. It's completely my pleasure. We have known each other for a few years now, and we are like friends, so I, I'm very, very happy to be here today. Thank you, Tom. Fantastic. So, first question. Tell me a little bit about Chit Ron, John. Where did you grow up? Where were you educated? Uh, and then lastly, what motivated you to write about uh, deep learning? Uh, well, so uh, you asked where I grew up and how it all started. A little bit uh, hitting the nostalgia chord. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take some uh, time to go back uh, to the past. And I see a lot of things that happened when I was growing up that ultimately led, led me to a place that I could even think of starting to write a book. Uh, I was born in a rural place, uh, uh, basically where my mom belongs to in, in a state called Bihar in India. And when I was in my, basically when I was old enough to have my senses to remember anything, I was in a uh, small town called Rurki uh, in India again. Uh, my father was doing PhD at that time at IIT Roorkee. It's one of the prestigious uh, universities in India. And uh, now I can think of that at such a young age, I was exposed to such an academic environment. Everyone around us was doing something interesting, something advanced in academia. And my father was doing PhD. Uh, I was seeing him doing that every day. I used to go to his lab almost every, at least once every week. Those were the beginnings. And then uh, after that, uh, we all moved back to Jamshedpur. Um, I call Jamshedpur as my hometown, my, uh, my primary place, because uh, I did all, pretty much all of my schooling in Jamshedpur. Uh, and uh, yeah, all of my friends my, belong there. It's also a small town, uh, and one good thing that I think comes with uh, growing up in a small town is we have very close friendships, very real friendships, um, and I used to spend good amount of time with those friends, and I still remember uh, back in school, in high school, actually, uh, my friends were to my friends would come to me to study, and I used to teach them. And I remember that uh, I liked doing that, and they loved to uh, spend time with me learning things. And I developed this skill of explaining things simply uh, while I was doing that. So we definitely had great teachers at school, but. It's not unusual that most times the teachings uh, from teachers are not at, it's not every time at a level that students will get it because we are kids, we think differently, we have a limited view. So I somehow understood both sides and I could, I could see wh why my friends are not getting an idea, a concept, why are not they following something? And I could see through their eyes and therefore I could perhaps explain better. And I still remember that days before the exam, in fact, the night before the exam, uh, I will have like bunch of my friends over to my home, uh, so much so that the principal of my school also got to know about this. and. So I was considered a, a bright student and he got worried and he called my father and he said, 
uh, I think your son, uh, no, uh, no, uh, sorry. Uh, so I used to do that in school as well. In school, I would spend more time uh, teaching my friends and uh, my principal noticed this and he called my father and said, uh, you have your, your son is bright and maybe he should spend more time in learning himself than spending time with friends and teaching. Uh, and my father said, <laughs> uh, sir, you don't know. Uh, you have seen only in school. All those guys come back home as well. <laughs> <laughs> and all of this happens a lot more back at home. So things happened as is and uh, uh, all of those time spent uh, with friends. Actually, I, if I look back, I see all of that helped me today. Um, I, I find it easier to explain concepts um, because I think I've done it so many times uh, from early in childhood. And uh, I'm talking more about my childhood experiences than my recent uh, academic or otherwise uh, professional experiences because I think uh, little things that happen during that early primary years, uh, which is easy to forget, but I think those are the building blocks of where we come today. I, I have another example of one of my um, uh, English language teachers back at school, uh, again, high school. Her name is Sumna Brahma. And I, I had this interest in learning language and I, I thought that I learned good and I know good enough. Um, but I, I was speaking something and I mispronounced a word which, for which I was confident that I'm pronouncing it right. And she corrected me. And then it was kind of a realization that uh, I should never think that I know enough. I have to keep learning. And I learned even better. I, I spent more time learning the language better. And it has definitely helped me. So all those early years, all those early building blocks have uh, uh, helped me <coughs> over time. And then recently, if I look back in my recent past from my PhD to now, um, I, uh, so after school, I went to IIT Kharagpur uh, back in India, a very nice prestigious school. And then I came to Georgia Tech to do my PhD. And uh, during this PhD time, I spent sufficient time in giving myself space to absorb ideas, develop ideas, uh, solutions. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a very nice advisor, Dr. Kamran Penabar. Uh, he gave me my space to explore, learn, do things yourself. And I flourish in that in kind of environment. Uh, and during that time, I learned a lot doing things myself, I learned a lot, a lot. I learned how to think, how to deconstruct complex problems and arrive at solutions. And uh, all of that ultimately led me to, uh, to a point that I thought of writing a book. Fantastic, well, congratulations on the book. And, and I think um, you know, that story sets the, the groundwork really nicely because um, I think what you know, folks who buy the book and read the book will find is you're able to um, you know take complex ideas and, and break them down so that uh, anyone uh, can get a at least a, an elementary understanding of what deep learning is all about. And let's face it, data science is a complicated field, right? And many business people today are still sort of trying to figure it all out, right? Uh, what does artificial intelligence mean, right? What, how can it uh, help my business? Um, what machine learning and, and how does it operate? And uh, what is deep learning? So perhaps you could, for uh, the listening audience, share with us sort of how those three terms, uh, uh, what they mean and, uh, you know, in the context of uh, uh, the greater uh, field of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Glad you asked this question. Uh, there are multiple answers to this. And actually, we are not limited to only these three terms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. We have others as well, such as data mining, data analytics, uh, statistical learning, 
and so on. Now, all of it majorly started from statistics and uh, statistics combined with, with math, definitely a, a lot of it is mathematical. Um, but several things started from a statistic and then uh, expanded into all of these new fields. Why we have different names? One of the reason is a little bit uh, politics in uh, academia as well, and not in a bad sense, it's actually in a novel sense. Uh, so think of uh, all these bright researchers, and they do very novel research. Uh, and most, most of them want those research to be pioneering. Uh, and if I call my field same as your field, I will no longer be a pioneer. And that resulted into these uh, new fields like data mining uh, and machine learning. Machine learning is basically a, uh, people from computer science field. They started to work on statistical learning and they had a little bit different way of solving things or basically coming up with algorithms. And uh, they started to call it machine learning because they, it's just good to be uh, a little bit different. Uh, artificial intelligence was used in various contexts early on. It was usually uh, related to neural networks, which is now called as deep learning. But now, because we have so many fields, it is easier to uh, have artificial intelligence overarching everything, machine learning, deep learning, data science, everything is generally considered to be within the umbrella of artificial intelligence. And within that, now we have machine learning and deep learning as uh, most commonly used terms and uh, basically techniques. And Machine learning and deep learning are really different, and I will like to explain how they are different. Yeah. So I just said that we have many fields that came up just because people wanted to call it differently, but machine learning and deep learning are truly different, and let me explain how. Machine learning is like formula-based learning. Most of us have some, uh, some we still remember some of the physics that we learned earlier, and one of them was one of the Newton's law for uh, one of the Newton's law, which says force equal to mass times acceleration. Simple words: F is equal to m times a m a. This is a formula, and how did Newton arrive at such a formula? Uh, what he did is he ran some experiments. He took uh, some metal balls of different weights, one kilogram, five kilogram, and so on, and then uh, uh, slung it at some acceleration and then measured the force, which is the impact on the wall. And then he ran several experiments and he did, did all these observations, measurements. And from that, he came up with this expression, which best explained his data, which was force equal to mass times acceleration. Now, of course, this is not an exact formula. There's always an error to it, but for all practical purposes, you can ignore that error and just assume F equal to MA. It's a nice expression. It is easily interpretable. You can see it, feel it, and you can see how mass and acceleration independently and together results into the force. Similarly, other uh, physics uh, relationships were discovered, such as the path of a trajectory. When you throw a ball, uh, there is a equation, I of course do not remember that equation, but there is one equation which can tell you the uh, path of that trajectory. But tell me one thing, Tom, uh, you must be uh, playing frisbee or just uh, volleyball or uh, your son must be throwing ball at you and you can catch it. When Liam throws ball at you, you know how much to extend your hand and where the ball is landing and you can catch the ball. In your brain, do you really solve that equation of trajectory? No, uh, I use my senses, right? So I see the velocity of the ball, uh, where, what, what direction it's coming from and, and I react uh, you know, using my muscles to reach out uh, 
to where I need to to catch the ball. Exactly. So you do not need to know that formula. You do not calculate anything. Anything you think a formula in your brain. You, as you said, you use your senses, and you develop that senses over time by practice during your childhood. And the brain is so smart that when brain is learning, it understands the problem and the complexity of the problem, and automatically. divides that bigger problem into smaller arbitrary sub problems as you said velocity of the ball the wind the way liam has thrown it and so on and your brain splits this big problem of where the ball is going to land into very sub problems solves them individually puts them together and ultimately you know where the ball is going to land and this is what deep learning tries to imitate deep learning does not it does not strive to get you a final formula a formula that you can see or interpret deep learning automatically tries to break down a complex problem into arbitrary sub problems solve them independently and bring them together to tell you the final solution the benefit of deep learning is now as opposed to machine learning so as i gave the previous example machine learning is like that it gives you a formula formula that you can feel interpret deep learning gives you a solution a final solution the benefit is with deep learning you can solve complex problem and get better results most of the problems around us are too complex deep learning can handle them and it it gives you quite accurate results the downside is you don't see anything you don't see how it is working most of the time at least and but with machine learning you can see and feel and you can make interpretation so both of them have their own um, uh good sides and downsides uh and you choose based on what you are based on what you want uh, but yeah to answer your question this is the main difference between machine machine learning and deep learning and what a great answer in fact i think that leads uh quite nicely into my next question uh and along the lines of you know machines not having uh, senses at least yet uh right uh, deep learning gets them a little bit closer to that because it's not quite as formulaic as machine learning is but in the introduction of your book uh dr ron john you draw a simile between deep learning and the art of cooking which i found fascinating uh then you go on to share understanding of the how which transcends deep learning uh and can you go further into what was meant by this inference and expand a little bit on it for our listeners sure uh, actually it goes be more than what what you see that there in the book so i was writing this book over the past one or two years and while i was also doing a full time job uh, in in our startup and our full time job is also quite uh, it requires hard work it strenuous and we we love mm-hmm. that but uh, we write but writing book is almost equally as strenuous so my days were quite long uh, many times i would get up i will start like 5 am in the morning and Uh, I'll use the first part of the day to do some writing, and then some in the evening. So basically, a very long days. Um, in when you have such long days and you are doing it uh, every day, you want an a a a do your own zone where you are relaxed. And different people have different places, different ways they do that. Uh, it was cooking for me. cooking is therapeutic and meditative for me uh, when i am cooking i i get so relaxed i lose any stress that i may have developed and i i just love doing that you must be a much better cook than i am because it completely stresses me out <laughs> <laughs> well i i like act, actually uh, i like eating <laughs> i i like eating good food and uh, to do that i thought i might as well start cooking good as well so that it's 
I, I can get it whenever I want it. <laughs> so that 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 was my history on how why I started cooking because I I like good food. But I really developed the skill, and it's interesting that when I was writing book, I became a very good cook because when I was writing this book and I was taking time out in my cooking. Uh, I was drawing parallels on both sides. What I learned is, so when I'm cooking, maybe I'll start by looking, I, I start by, in, in any way, I, I call myself as a liberated cook because I do not uh, care so much to follow what is told in a recipe. And there are so many stories with it. Uh, I'll just say one or two. So my wife, Bharti, would get freaked out sometimes when she sees what I'm doing. And she's like, this is never done like this. I'm like, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> just come back when, when it is done. So I, I did a lot of that. And what I learned is, it is not so important to look at a recipe and follow a recipe because I, I, I would go through this piece, but instead of going through the recipe and following it word by word verbatim, I would more try to understand why they are doing what they are doing. And then when I understood that, I will take something that I learned in a completely different recipe, unrelated with what I'm doing right now, but I learned something there why they were doing it there and I could use it here, although it was not told because I now know the fundamentals of how things work in cooking. And when I understood the fundamentals of how things work in cooking in terms of what food you are using, what spices, the level of heat, I understood how important it is to regulate or modulate the level of heating at different stages of co cooking because the way it interacts with the food is, and the spices, it is very important. So I understood when, that, when I learned all these fundamentals, uh, my cooking, the level of my cooking just transcended how I used to cook before that. And that is so true with what we do in deep learning, data science, or any other field that, that you can think of, that when we start to understand the fundamentals, why things work, how things work, how they are behaving the way they are behaving, then you start to truly get how you can put together. So just like what we do in cooking, we have to put together so many different ingredients to make your final uh, food. In deep learning or in data science in general, you have to put together so many things, starting from data, then pre-process the data, how you want to pre-process the data, what type of models you have to try, what different varieties of model you have to try, all the hyperparameters, how you have to put them together, how you have to architect them. All of this is like developing a recipe. And when only you understand each element of that very deeply, you can develop a recipe that is really the best. So based on what you've just described, I am clearly a machine learning cook because if I don't follow the recipe and the formula to a T, then the food is inedible. But you, you're more of an artist, so you sort of wing it. You know how the spices come together. You know how much heat you got to use. So you're able to uh, um, you know, cook something delicious using the deep learning approach. Is that a good way to put it? It, it is, yeah. It's been nice. I'm coming to eat at your house then because clearly your food is much better than mine. Definitely, I would love to. Love okay. It. Hey, uh, we're running out of time here, but and it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend our readers, if you have any uh, interest in deep learning, to pick up Dr. Ron John's book. It's, it's really well done. Uh, I've enjoyed reading it. If you had to give the listeners one thing you'd like them to take away from your book, what would that be, uh, Chip? Good question. Uh, one thing if I want my readers to understand and take away with themselves is to simplify everything. And that is how the book is uh, attempted to be uh, written and therefore read, is simplify every concept. Uh, deep learning, the subject deep learning is considered quite an abstruse concept, uh, abstruse subject. 
with a lot of convoluted theory and all. But when you go into its elements, you will realize that they are all very simple things put together and that's why they become very novel. And it's with everything uh, around you. Anything that, you, that might appear complex to you is actually made up of simple building blocks. And try to understand that simple building blocks. Try to try to learn the simplicity and cherish, cherish cherish that simplicity, and that way you will first understand everything better, and then you will come up with solutions that are simple. Always remember, the problems that you solve are complex problems. Complex solutions to complex problems lead to nowhere. Simple solutions lead to good solutions to complex problems. And arriving at simple solutions is not straightforward, otherwise everyone would be able to do that. You can only arrive at simple solutions when you understand the subject completely and try to do that. When you are reading the book, try to simplify the concepts, understand the simplicity, so that when you are out there making solutions, you are able to come up with simple, simple architectures and solutions. Dr. Ranjan, thank you very much for being our guest speaker on this edition of Process Finder University. The title of the book is Understanding Deep Learning. You can get it on uh, Amazon.com. I'm sure it's destined to be a bestseller in, in the world of, of data science. So thank you again for being our guest on today's podcast and uh, good luck. Thank you, Tom. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening in to this podcast brought to you by Process Minor University, featuring Dr. Chit Ranjan, author of Understanding Deep Learning. Be sure to join us next time as Kareem Porak, co-founder and CEO of Process Minor, interviews well-known Bill Woodall from Virginia Tech on the finer points of process monitoring. In the meantime, stay well and innovate boldly.